So I'm going to ask, we've gone over by about 15 minutes. And so especially for parents, I'm going to ask for your permission. If you kindly just allow me to go for another two hours. So no, but please allow me, we'll go over just by about two hours. Uh, those of you who are in the crash, uh, please um, uh, bear with us. Just for about 15 more minutes, um, uh, we'll do that. I, I hope that you guys here can inform the people out in our, our children um, at Kijani that we'll just be going a bit over. Pastor Lunga gave you uh, a context of what we have been talking about the past two Sundays. We talked about the problem with ethnicity, and last, last week we talked about the great deception. The problem with ethnicity is that we are actually more, okay, um, we have actually more in common than we think we don't, okay? That was just the essence especially because of our profession in, in Jesus the Christ. Okay, there's much more we share in common than our ethnicity. Then last week we said that the, the great deception is that we think our leaders are the problem. The actual problem is us. And if, you, if, you're, if you're walking with us on this thing today, we're going to go more about if... if if the problem, if we are the problem, then what are the issues? Turn with me to the book of Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14, just to give you a, a quick um, um, context. Uh, last week we talked about it, but today we're reading. Moses was leading Israel. The 40 years or so were almost over. No, the one year, rather, were almost over. Um... Uh, after they came out of Egypt. And it is at this point, it is at this point that there are days journey from the southern tip of the promised land. They had Kadesh Barnea, an oasis, and Moses sends out 12 spies for a reconnaissance uh, mission into the promised land. And the intel they come back with is that that land indeed is what God said it is. It is a land, okay, of milk and honey. But there are also fortified cities. They are strong military people. We can't take them. And in giving that negative report, two people, Caleb and Joshua, came and said, yes, we can. Yes, we can take them. And there was an argument. And those who had the numbers ended up persuading the rest of the Israel camp, the camp of Israel. And verse 1 of chapter 14 says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly and gathered, the, sorry, the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephune, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. And said to the entire Israelite army assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us in the land of in, in that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to the tent of the meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the things I have 
performed amongst them. I will strike them down and with a plague destroy them, but I will make you into a great nation, stronger than they. Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear. By your power, you brought these people up from among them. They will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people and that you, Lord, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put all these people to death, leaving none alive, the nations who have heard this report about you will say the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he has promised. Verse 17, now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, forgiving sin and rebellion, yet does not leave the guilty and punish. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generations. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sins of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, this is verse 20, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I have promised on oath to their ancestors. No, no one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Because, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. I'll bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back the way you came from tomorrow and set out towards the desert along the route to the Red Sea. The Lord said this to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home except Caleb son of Jephune and Joshua son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them to enjoy the land you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your body Bodies lie in the wilderness. If there is a problem, guys, then what is the issue? Let me quickly go. I think the first issue is that we are too much in a hurry. Allow me to explain. The pace of life we have, we have acquired has defined a lot of what we want. Our pursuit to whatever we want is informed by, I want to say, a dissatisfaction, a discontentment, and possibly disillusionment with the status quo. We are in a hurry. We are in a hurry to see something happen. We, are, we, are, we want to keep up with our peers. Keeping up with the Omolos. That is my version of keeping up with the Joneses. It plays out in a couple of ways. One of them is, is there's this ubiquitous time clock that we want to beat or we want to keep up with. It informs our decisions. You're always in a hurry, never giving yourself margins to work with, moving from one place to another. You're busy, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you are productive. But there's a speed that you're picking up. You want to do. You're always doing something. This is informed by your possible disillusionment, disaffection, or discontentment with your status quo. Another way it could play out is with your biological clock. You're saying, hey, I've passed, 
I'm past that 30 mark. I'm on the third floor. Hey, it's time to find a life partner. And it doesn't look like there's anybody around. So you end up settling. You settle for what you think is right. Because of that biological time clock, you make that decision, you come, you go through PMCC, you get married. Five years later, you're at Pastor Olunga's door saying things are elephant. But it was the biological clock and not the will of God. Yet being busy, being on a rush, might also, def might also inform your discontentment with your career tra trajectory. You've been in this, this grind for 10 years and it's not seemingly yielding fruit. You're getting impatient. You're not seeing results. Like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 verse 11, there was a man, Luke says there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Being impatient with what is going to happen in front, he was given what he thought he deserved, but squandered it. You're in a hurry. Another problem, another issue is you imagine you are too important. When a Kenyan is in a fix and wants to get out, what are their reflex? What's the question they ask? Do you know somebody? <laughs> and in your group of friends, there is that person who does. The person says, I know a guy. Sometimes I am that guy in that group. I know a guy. Okay? Say no more. I know a guy. Done. Okay? <laughs> when, I was, when, 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 when the Interfaith Council lobby, uh, Interfaith Council um, came together to address the COVID issue, COVID-19 issues in the country, they lobbied the government for religious workers to be, to support those who are actually on the front lines. There is a soft way of supporting them. And once they were granted that, I was one of the first to get the job. I walked to my local um, uh, Kajo clinic and got my AstraZeneca job. Two months later, I w okay, about two weeks before, I got a text from the Ministry of Health saying, your job is coming up in two weeks. 48 hours before that, I got another text. And on the morning of the day, I got another text. It's like the Ministry of Health knows Goi. So I went to back to my local Kajo health clinic and asked I'm here for my job. He says, okay, for you, we are out. We are out here. You need to go to the county center, okay, or the place, the central place. And so I was like, ah, I can't go, you know, where I stay, traffic. I was like, okay. So I asked for a number. When I got the number and all that, and I called, guess who was on the other side? A rela of mine was running that particular center. <laughs> I just don't know a guy. That guy knows me. <laughs> so, she told me, hey, you come. So I came the following day. And she said, what time? Nine o'clock. And at nine o'clock, I was there. But when I got there, kulikuwa <laughs> watu. I asked one of the guards who was there, you know, how long, how, when did these people come? Some of them were there, he said, even before six o'clock. So I t called my relative, and she says, I can't talk, you send a text. So I sent a text, Kunat Wengi Apa. She says, just come. Oh, no. Smile again. Oh, no. What are you going to do? In all good conscience, I decided not to. So I switched off my phone. It was my day off. I switched off my phone, and uh, which I usually do on my day off. Note to self, to you guys, if you want to catch me on Monday, you won't. But nevertheless, when I turned on my phone, there were missed calls from her, messages and all that, and uh, I kind of like gave an excuse. I kind of chengad her. 
you know, and all that. But she says, come next week on Monday, okay? And this time, all right, call me before you get there. So I did that. And I was there early. I got there just before 7. I had ticket number 68. Okay? So I was like, cool, number 68. I also had my book to read, and I knew I was going to be waiting. So I called her, I said, Niko Apa. I was like, okay, sir, we haven't opened, we're setting things up. I'm going somewhere, these guys. <laughs> so an announcement from the, the AP police officer who was there said, give a thing, if you're coming for your first job, this line, so everybody moved. There were many more. We were almost 500 there. If you're coming for a second job here, and if you're essential services, this line. Essential services will go on fast. Go with your data. <laughs> the AP. I was like, eh? eh? I walked gingerly. <laughs> I was the first one in, or at least so I thought. And when I got in, you know, I met my, my relative. What's up? What's up? You know, there. I filled the forms. I was given my second job. Okay? But around there, there were senior government officials. There were deputy governors in there. There were a few MPs. Na Pastor Goi. We think we are too important. That we find a way to short circuit the system, guys, to enjoy a privilege or personal benefit that we do not really deserve. Yeah. Another issue is we think we are too clever. <laughs> it is a known, it is, it is a known fact that the circumstances we find ourselves in, and Vivian, you're going to find this, that things don't work as we want. In fact, things don't work sometimes, or very inefficiently. So we figure out ways to beat the system or get around it. So let me not go to Gava. Let's just go in our life. We go for what is cheap or substandard so that uh, we want to get the job done, but we actually end up regretting it. You know that adage, cheap is... For those of you who drive a car, own a car, um, when it breaks down and your mech tells you uh, you need to replace one of the parts. And I don't know about mechs, but see me, mechs just know we middle class guys. He says, there are two options. <laughs> there are two options. There's this one, genuine parts. It's expensive, okay? Lakini, your car is going to run for that, yeah? It's expensive. And the experience. But then there's this part. They don't tell you the consequences. And we take this part. Uh -huh. I won't say where. <laughs> Six months later, you are back at your next place with the same problem. And you say, Oduori. <laughs> I don't know why it's neither. Oduori, Otis, Moas, Joro. Those are just one names. Anybody hear what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. You're complaining that they played you. But that this is what you do. You go, you try to think you can outwit things. The system. And this plays out in other areas of your life. I think the other issue here is that we are, we are just foolish. In the words of Octopis, Octopiso, Nini ni Wajinga. We know the signs. We are fully aware of the consequences. We even know people who have gone that route. Some of them who are actually close to us. They have come out bruised, battered. But we still do it. I tell you where this is most evident, guys. It's in how we spend our money. Dave Ramsey in the book, The Money Makeover, says this about many of us. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. I'd like to add or do not even know Instagram. You see, guys, it's not the big things that we see out in the open. 
It's the tiny things. It's the tiny things we do over and over. Cumulatively, these bring down the things that we have been working for. Songs of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. These are the things that will actually mess the harvest. What we have worked for. The proverbial little foxes are still here and are at work in our sinful hearts, our sinful minds. And we do not learn from history like these in Numbers chapter 14. They are referred to as the example that we should never follow. Those of you who grew up in the city know this. This is what our parents used to say, especially our, ma our mothers. Don't be like so and so. Because they are bad influence here or there. In the Bible, Numbers 14 is that so and so. We should be like that generation of Israel. To you, I want to say to you that Numbers 14 generation is that Iwe Funzo Kwa Wengine. They are the ones of the Bible. The writer of Hebrews telling the church at that time who was going through persecution. Don't wave back in your belief. But in chapter 3 verse 16 he asks, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? To whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they are not able to enter because of their unbelief. These guys saw the ten plagues that were meted out on Egypt. They stood before the Lord God. A pillar of fire by day, a cloud, of, uh, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They passed through the Red Sea. They saw Pharaoh's army being vanquished. They got water from a dry desert. Manna every day. But yet chose to disobey. This is folly and rebellion. And are part of our downfall. For we who are believers. This is something we need to be cognizant of. Because it plays out in the Kenya today. So what Goi? How does this help us today? How does this help cocoa production in Ghana. In as much as God raised another generation after these guys, subsequent generations did not learn. And like us, stand condemned. Watch this. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 1. Judah's sin, Judah was a breakaway nation from what was known as Israel is engraved with an iron tool inscribed with a flint point on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. Even their children remember their altars and are Asherah poles beside the spreading trees on the high hills. In other words, these guys have given themselves to idolatry. They have left the God who they've known through history for idols. My mountain in the land of your wealth, verse 3 goes on, and all your treasures I will give away as plunder. This is the judgment that will follow. Together with your high places because of your sin throughout your country. Through your own fault, you will lose the inheritance I gave you. I will enslave you to your enemies in a land you do not know. For you have kindled my anger and it will burn forever. Verse 5. This is what the Lord says. If you are thinking, I want to reiterate from last week. If you're thinking a politician or somebody else is going to solve the problem, cast are you who trusts in man, who draws strength from their mere, from mere flesh, whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But God continues to talk us about a converse. Verse 7, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, hallelujah, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It leaves, its leaves rather, are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. And here is the warning. The heart is deceitful above all things. 
and beyond cure, who can understand it? Guys, this is what informs the Kenya we want. And so, guys, the Lord, knowing this, searches each one of our hearts and examines our mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. So, allow me to answer this question, what are the issues and what is the remedy? I have three things, but allow me to comment about what I know and what I see. It summarizes all this. If there is a Kenya we want, there is a cost we have to pay. A good friend of mine, Kawira Mwanthi, a market researcher, one time said this to me. Everyone wants to be Nelson Mandela, but not everyone wants to be in jail for 27 years. So the first cost here, guys, is we need to assume or get into an obedience culture. We need to learn how to obey. And guys, what I'm saying is, if our walk with the Lord is for, for real, is legit, it needs to translate in our context. So if we are believing that God's word is true and walking in obedience, then we need to also model obedience. And we can learn from Christ. Christ. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used or to be grasped. But rather, he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest places and gave him the name that is above every name. In the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and underneath the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus the Christ is Lord to the glory of our Lord God and Father. What Jesus did is he modeled obedience. He remained resolute on his mission, which was not just to die, but to obey his father's will. John 4, 34, John quoting him said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And I think we can learn from Jesus' example what it means to obey. If we want a country of law and order, then we need to obey and follow the law. But again, there's a small caveat. We know that the law can also be an ass. The law of the land is made by fallible and finite people. But we at least should appreciate the spirit of the law. And abide by it. PLO Lumumba one time remarked, the problem with Kenya is that it promulgated the new constitution, but does not have a culture of constitutionalism. <laughs> In other words, it is one thing. It is one thing to have the law. It is an, it's another thing to adhere to the principles undergirding the tenets informing the law. And let me give you an example. The red light in traffic is not a suggestion. <laughs> Following the law, guys, and obeying it is actually a culture we have to assume. And so Jeremiah pronouncing judgment on Judah shows us this relationship between our wickedness and the state of uncondition of our heart and the desire to follow. And God now looks beyond it looking at our motive and looking at our action and not our actions. Like Israel, though being emancipated from 400 years of slavery and being delivered from Egypt, they had run to the promised land, but in their hearts they had not left. The second thing would be there's, there's going to be an inconvenience. Being inconvenient, sorry, 
being inconvenienced is going to be inevitable. Jesus meeting a rich young ruler having a conversation what does it mean to obey God and follow God Jesus says you know what does it mean to be good he says follow the law and he stated what he has done Jesus said yeah you have done very good this is in Luke chapter 18 verse 18 onwards but Jesus says you have done all this yes all right since you've done all this sell all that you have and come and follow me this girl is like, eh, Jesus. Itakwangori. Deuces, man. And then Jesus retorts and says, guys, okay, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to go through the kingdom of God. And guys were like, whoa, God, what Jesus, what have you said? You know, this guy, we know him. Okay? He walks alone. He comes to church. He died. See, he's blessed. But Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. He's actually referring to that that transformation can actually happen. This is the true, hash, the true hashtag in our Ezekana. To obey to follow the law in a context where no one appreciates this will inconvenience you guys. It will frustrate you. In some places, the system is messed up. And nevertheless, if you want to be the Kenya we want, or the Kenya we want, prepare to be inconvenienced. Do not give in to taking the easy way out or the least place of least resistance. Let me give you an example. If you're going to Nyayo House to get government services, know there are going to be long lines. Know there are people who are going to skip the line. But you will still be served. So go with a book. Okay? Enough data. Okay? Power bank. Okay? Or if you don't have the flexibility at work, all right, transfer everything to your phone and work as you're there. It's going to be there. You will eventually be served. Or even take leave. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have also decided I'm going to take life slower. Maybe it could be because of my age now. But one of the things is I give myself margins so that I'm not in a hurry. So when we're in a hurry, we try to take shortcuts. Or we make bad decisions. So I only do two meetings in a day. I try not to do too much. The inconvenience here is that work will be done much slower, but things will, be, will, get, will, will get done, but they will be done well. And lastly, as I close, persevere. Persevere because it's going to get rough, guys. If you are going to have a culture of obedience, ready to be inconvenienced, persevere, guys. Because you're in a world that works counterculture to you. You're swimming upstream. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul cautioning his audience says this actually to, 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 to Timothy he says everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted so prepare for war guys prepare to be singled out to be vilified and sometimes even victimized for going counter culture prepare to be the odd one out prepare that you might even be Facing something hostile. Your context might become hostile to you. So toughen up. Develop some thick skin. Suck it up. Because it's going to be a rough ride, guys. Who says it's going to be easy? James, recognizing the opposition that the church at his time was going to go through 
Encourage them in James chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Guys, it's going to be rough. You would even lose your job. And possibly we have seen people have lost their life. Nevertheless, in as much as you respond to this call of perseverance, I urge you to be wise and seek the Lord's wisdom. Verse 5 of this same chapter, 1 in James, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. It is important that you weigh the risks and tread carefully, always seeking wisdom from God's word. And I close with the words of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 6. Do not forsake wisdom. She will protect you, love her, and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom, though it costs all you have. Get understanding. Shall we pray? God, for real, <laughs> if you actually showed us the whole entire script, I don't think any one of us will still be here. But yet you have chosen in your wisdom to give us just what we actually need for today. And have left us to believe you, the God who is faithful for our future. So just like your son taught us to be obedient, May we surrender our wills and our ways to you. And somewhat, somehow, this discipline and this posture of our heart, Father God, may it begin to translate into our context where people don't have the culture and respect for the law of the land. Father God, I pray that you build our resilience that Lord would bear with the inconveniences. Because following you is not a convenient thing. For you said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is what Paul said. I think we need to recognize that. Because we live in a culture and a context where people do not honor or fear you. And mostly, Lord, we pray for your grace. That when we face the persecution, when we are vilified, when we are singled out, that, Lord, you'd give us the grace to endure and to persevere. We don't look for glory because all the glory belongs to you. May we have the grace and staying power to face whatever comes ahead of us. Even if they mean false accusation, reputational damage, loss of employment, and for some, it could also be their very life. If it is the Kenya we want, Father God, teach us of the follower of Christ we need to be. This is what discipleship actually is that it plays out in our context. That indeed, Father God, as we become more like your son, there's going to be change in the Kenya we want. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.